Welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast, where we talk with the people behind the current events and breakthroughs in brain implants in an understandable way, helping bring together various fields involved in neuroprosthetics. Here is your host, Ladin Yurichek. Hey everyone, and welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast. Today's guest is a little bit different than the ones we usually have. It's Tim Marzullo, Dr. Tim Marzullo, and he is not an academic. He's not a professor or a principal investigator like the majority of the guests that I've had on the show, but he is actually a co-founder of a startup. So this startup is Backyard Brains, and they make kind of homemade equipment or open source equipment to teach and demonstrate neuronal activity and everything that goes along with neuroscience. They have a great TED Talk. I I highly recommend it to watch it. I'll actually post it in the show description so you can watch it. And with this, they demonstrate that by tensing your muscles, you can actually hear neuronal activity and you can hear the signals coming from the neurons in the arm when you tense your arm. And on top of this, they then have another guest another uh, you know volunteer come up on stage and they are able to control the f- second person's arm with the first person's arm so they just kind of wired up in such a way that whenever one person squeezes the arm the other person involuntarily also squeezes the arm it's really really cool as i said in the or i did i, I think i cut this out of the the podcast but i literally i laughed out loud i was so happy when i saw this this is like i was like this is so amazing and this would be such a good demonstration for kids high schoolers anybody who's thinking about getting into neurology or brain machine interfaces or neural implants or anything like this because as we talk about on the show the big problem is really you don't get access to this kind of equipment until you're already in grad school until you've been in university for many many years that's when you finally can see neuronal spikes and actually measure nerves and measure neurons Uh, so this is a really fun way and to, to demonstrate this for under a hundred dollars. So if you're thinking about if you're thinking about demonstrating this with some people, or if you have a class or something like this, I think this would be a perfect thing to bring out. And it's really really fun. Gets people interested, and then they ex- ex- exactly understand what it is that you're doing. So hopefully you guys will enjoy this, and we'll talk more on the other side. Yeah, so the the TED Talk was the genesis of an invention that Greg had built, which was a shield for the Arduino, which was a modification of our uh, muscle amplifier, our electromyography amplifier, to fit on the popular Arduino microcontroller. And any of the... um, People listening right now certainly know what an Arduino is. It's a uh, just a low cost, ten to thirty dollar microcontroller for that's really popular with artists and students. And you can use it to you know to make musical instruments, to uh, uh, do science observation, to control robotics. So Greg had made the shield to make it easy for people to control things with their muscles because that was a request we had received from a lot of um, educators, uh, particularly in physics and engineering, who wanted to kind of play with neural interfaces. And also, um, as we talked on earlier before we started recording, um, we're, we're active in Latin America. So I spend a great part of the year in Chile where I run a laboratory here and we do a lot of educational development. And as part of a Chilean science camp that I was participating in, uh, we're kind of 300 high school students from around the country go to a campsite and it's a week long camp where they do science experiments and they invite you know, scientists from around the country to give talks. They were inviting me um, as kind of the foreigner scientist who speaks with a weird accent. You know? um, and we have another invention which is sort of popular, which is the RoboRoach, which allows you to stimulate the antenna nerves of a cockroach. And we have a Bluetooth interface so you can control the Bluetooth with your cell phone and move the cockroach left versus right uh, for a couple of minutes. So, you know, someone, if, you, if you're giving a scientific talk, and a scientist pulls out a cockroach and then puts a backpack on it and then pulls out their cell phone and starts controlling the cockroach. I mean, even the most jaded uh, student who has no interest in science is gonna gonna be curious about what what's going on here, right? So it's a really it's a really good preparation for talking about neural interfaces. And so that was something I was proposing doing for the science camp, but uh, they had uh, they were uncomfortable with doing experiments on the cockroach on stage due to you know a very real concern for the sensibilities of 
the students and asked if, if it was possible to do that something similar on a human where you know another one person could control another human so uh one saturday afternoon i sat down with the muscle spiker shield that greg had invented and i started playing the a TENS unit, which is a transcutaneous uh, electrical nerve stimulator, and then modifying some Arduino code and uh, playing with some cables. Uh, we, uh, we made some code where when you flex your muscles and increase your electromyographic activity recorded on your forearm, it triggers a relay which allows current to flow through the transcutaneous nerve stimulator, which, you know, so when you flex, you can, you can stimulate the nerve on your own arm or another person's arm. And it's, it's kind of a cool demo explaining recording and simulation technologies. But when we actually explain how the invention works, the engineers in the audience uh, always throw us a wry smile because they realize how simple it is. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But it is it is a really good demonstration, as you said. So is your target market uh, children or, or grade school people? Or, or... So, yeah, so um, as a neurotech company, our uh, focus is on education and public engagement. So we design things for scientists as well. Uh, scientists are, are big, uh, university scientists are a big uh, customer base of hours and university classes. But yeah, our, our target is, you know, our dream of Backyard Bain started is that we wanted to bring neuroscience and neural engineering into the high school class classroom. So everything we design is is designed with a 14 to 20 year old student in mind. And of course, people younger and people older can use it. But that's kind of what, what I'm thinking about is, could a 16-year-old version of ourselves use this equipment? And would they find it interesting? Oh, so they, they use it as well. It's not just for demonstrations to, I don't know, display some of the, the fundamentals? Yeah, so... When we were introducing ourselves before we started uh, recording uh, the podcast, I, I mentioned how difficult our doctorates were in neural engineering. Combining neuroscience and engineering is very challenging, a very interesting field. Um, but when you, it's really hard to get into neuroscience, I was uh, in a lab full of engineers. That's where I met my best friend Greg Gage, where we started this company together, and we were always jealous of, you know, the electrical engineering fields, the computer science fields the mathematics fields, the artistic fields, because people can start as early as they want, right? You can have kids taking piano lessons at five years old or younger. Uh, most electrical engineers and computer scientists were playing with circuits when they were 12 or 13 or younger, you know, like many of the now very wealthy founders of companies in California, you know, and there's always stories that, hey, they programmed, they programmed the first computer when they were 12, you know? But in neuroscience, you really, uh, you don't get access until, into to neuroscience until you're unless you go to the really good teaching neuroscience schools like Cornell or the University of Washington, um, you really, it's really hard to get access to neuroscience equipment and technology until you're in grad school, which is just kind of strange because it's a really delayed time to, to learn about a field. So uh, the, the foundation of Backyard Brains is to make uh, educational grade versions of the technology we used for our graduate work so that high school students could begin playing with neurons and muscles and neural interfaces. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, how has the reception been so far? I mean, do you have students asking about how they could learn more? Yeah, so the measure of success is uh, if we're jealous of our customers. And, uh, and I mean that in a, uh, in a, in a tender way. So um, we, get, we get pictures uh, from parents uh, uh, with students in front of, uh, standing in front of their science fair posters where, you know, they're recording from you know, neurons and crickets uh, or they're doing experiments on the activity of muscles and fatigue. And there's a picture, you know, of a, of a very happy 13 or 14 year old standing in front of a poster and they've won first prize in their regional or state science fair. You know, and so uh, Greg and I are jealous because we, we, we certainly participated in science fairs, right? And and if I was at a science fair and the person next to me was doing neural recordings, I would know I'm I'm done. Like I'm not I'm not gonna win against that. So so um, yeah. So the reception's been really good. So exactly what our original mission was to get earlier ages doing neuroscience and neural interface ex experiments while they're still in high school and doing science projects. It, yeah, it, it's after six years of the of the hustle of doing a of a, a neural technology startup uh, company. We're we're seeing it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's funny. So any parents listening to this, if you want your children to do very well in a science fair, get them a Backyard Brains probe. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it'll, it, it really gets uh, people's attention uh, because it's, it still is rather exotic doing uh, electrophysiology at the high school level. Yeah. And so, so how much does something like this cost and, and what's the learning curve for it? 
I spend a lot of time curating the experiment webpage and our educational team spends a lot of time working on a protocol, shooting videos, making sure our equipment's easy to use. So um, Greg and I also give a lot of talks um, to at educational conferences and science conferences and in high schools. And so we often roll into a high school or a high a university with our toolbox in hand. And so our gear has to work within minutes, right? So it's real. also a focus of Backyard Brains is equipment that can turn on uh, battery powered within two minutes you can have an experiment going so it's designed to be easy to use uh, that said electrophysiology is novel right so um, even if I say what does backyard brains do I can say we make neuroscience equipment but if I say we but to be more formal about what backyard brains does our principal business is biological amplifiers so what is a you know what is even a biological amplifier like what is electrophysiology uh, so it's the measurement of the electrical signals that living systems generate so we, you can study you know hearts brains neurons and we even have some experiments uh, studying the electrical vo voltages generated by plants like the venus flytrap and uh, the sensitive mimosa so the, pro the, the issue we have and the biggest uh, barrier for our customers is that you put a, a, an electrical amplifier in front of people um, and they haven't really had any experience with it, right? So if I put a telescope or a microscope in front of you, you may not have used a microscope in 10 years, but you know there's an eyepiece. You know there's a focus knob. You know you have to put something underneath the eyepiece. And if you look, you know there has to be a light to turn on. And if you look through the eyepiece and you don't see anything, you're going to think, well, maybe it's not in focus and you're going to start changing the knob, right? So that's just kind of general scientific equipment knowledge that most people have, right? Because almost everybody's used a microscope at some point in their educational experience. But if I give you a micro, an electronic amplifier and I say it's an electrical amplifier to, that amplifies the small voltages generated by your nerves and muscles and you put some electrode patches on your forearm and you flex and all you hear is noise, you're not going to think, oh, okay, yeah, that's noisy. Um, it's probably because I have this soldering iron, you know, I have this, uh, this light right next to my hand and it's generating electrical magnetic uh, noise in the form of 60 hertz. And maybe if I move the light further away from my arm, I can reduce the noise. Or uh, why do I hear that radio? Maybe there's a radio station nearby or on, maybe there's a radio tower on the roof of my building. Maybe I should go to another room that's farther away from the radio tower, you know, or, or why is the signal not working? Oh, I have the ground misplaced. So like, all that stuff is not hard, you know, because they're all just, those are all just anybody who's an electrophysiologist listening is, is probably smiling right now because I just mentioned like the three, the three tricks that we all learned when we were in graduate school. But that's really the biggest ba barrier. And when I'm uh, talking to customers on the phone or video, video conferencing with them, those are I just it's often just introducing them to what is electrical signal amplification, that electrical noise is part of electrical signal amplification. And there are ways to reduce the noise. You just have to train your ear to be able to to detect what is a biological signal and what is a, a muscle signal uh, or a heart signal and that's why all, almost all the backyard brains products have speakers so you can actually hear the signal because that's even when we were in grad school the best way to figure out um, if you're electrically if isolating neural signals was just to listen to the sound and uh, biologically generated electrical impulses have a very very distinctive sound and so just training people to learn to learn how to use that is the biggest barrier just just like I said with the analogy of a microscope just you know learning that you know we can extend it to a to a to a, a telescope like you use a telescope at night it'll be better to use it at night than during the day to see a star so just that, that general learning just the general knowledge of how to use uh, electrical amplifiers is is what we spend a lot of time on and that's the biggest barrier for our customers but all the other but everything else just switches and cables and it's relatively easy exactly so what is your what does your customers look like I mean is it more like science classes or something like this ordering 50 50 units for for testing or is it just they order two for demonstration or, or how does it look like especially uh, our customer mix is 50 percent um, universities so uh, the teaching university and so we've um, almost every any university you can name in the United States uh, you know has, has bought our gear in some form and then about uh, 30 to 40 percent are high schools so those are high school programs or summer programs for high schools and 10 percent are just um, the general public who maybe sees a TED talk or sees 
sees a magazine article or you know wants to uh, or or wants their you know their their child or their student to maybe perhaps do something related to neuroscience for a science fair and so the remaining 10% would could be considered like general public uh, consumer uh, market uh, sales so and w the pattern and of course with the consumer they usually buy one you know like you're not you as a individual person you're not gonna buy like 10 iPhones right like you buy one right <laughs> um, you're not gonna buy 10 telescopes you can buy one telescope but what we see at the university or the high school level is that maybe a, um, a technology focused teacher will be will hear about us and be intrigued and buy one or two units to start and then if the experience goes well in the classroom they can then uh, talk to, to their department or their uh, district and then you know maybe a year later we'll see a purchase of 30 units so um, after about six years of the hustle of this we are seeing more and more of those bulk sales which which obviously really uh, helps keep backyard brain sustainable that's good to hear you know I, I want to support you in this and that's that's why I want to have you on the podcast because I, I saw the TED talk and I was like whoa this is cool and I, I was literally you know they say lol laugh out loud I was literally laughing out loud and that hasn't happened in a long time. <laughs> oh, great. That means we're doing our job well. Yeah. So, okay. So why did you choose to go down this path instead of going, I don't know, down a professorship or graduate school, like graduate assistant or, or whatever the next steps would be after a PhD? Yeah, no, that's a, it's a very good question. So, um, uh, preparing to for this podcast, I um, uh, listened to an episode of uh, you know of your podcast. You know, like a colleague Kip who uh, Kip Ludwig uh, who I who is uh, who went to grad school with us. So a lot of the people on your podcast, we actually are colleagues of ours that we see at conferences, and so we are at, we are in that space. Um, but uh, when Greg and I were starting when we started this project, it was really just. Um, a pet project, you know, be it as, you know, engineers and creative people like to build things with their friends. Um, and so we did a lot of outreach when we were in grad school because uh, both Greg and I are the first scientists in our families. So uh, you, we, you know, we read a lot of science books and we, we attended science lectures when we were starting our education and inspired us to become a, a scientist. But we wanted to tell you know, the high school kids what a science actually does and what neuroscience is like. And so when we would go to uh, high schools as part of our out, just outreach activities as public engagement, you know, to get out of the lab and interface with the community. Um, we would we would do these kind of creative demos where kids would hold hands to represent synapses, or you'd uh, I would sometimes bring brains uh, from the medical school and say like this is a healthy human brain of someone who died of natural causes. This is a brain of someone with Alzheimer's, and the kids would go ew gross, you know, because you're holding a brain in your hand is kind of kind of novel, right? Um, Greg and I were always kind of um, disappointed because we couldn't show what we actually did in the lab because the electrophysiology equipment we uh, had in the lab, you know, was these huge racks of, you know, multi-channel systems of 128 channels with all these different pieces of equipment that talk to each other with custom software with that we would write. And sometimes we would have people come to the lab, but that was logistically harder, right? So we wanted to be able to show electrophysiology in a compelling way. And if you just want to show electrophysiology, you know, if you just want to show cells you don't, in, in a microscope, you can bring a microscope to a school. You don't have to bring a, a high school class to like the advanced confocal imaging lab, right? So if you just want to show an, the, the, the electrical spiking of a neuron, you only need a one channel amplifier. And then maybe we could do some experiments with insects uh, because insects are co commonly available at pet stores as feeder as feeder creatures and um, and just for uh, ethical reasons uh, we don't want to bring you know uh, mammals uh, and do experiments on mammals uh, you know in, in, in a high school classroom so using an insect preparation could we could we invent a uh, a one channel neuron spiker uh, neuron amplifier for less than a hundred dollars? That was also a, an engineering constraint that it would be less than a hundred dollars because we were you know we were grad students. We you know this was a self funded project in the beginning and we didn't really have that much money. So could we invent something that we ourselves could afford? And Greg, uh, before he went to grad school, was an industry engineer for AT and T and NCR and did have he had a lot of experience doing um, uh, electronic prototyping uh, for production like for products and so I uh, 
was talking to him and you know, he's my best friend. And I was like, could, could we do this? And so he started playing with uh, electronic, electronic circuits. I started looking into the bio biological part because we weren't really comparative neuroscientists at that point. We had done most of our um, graduate work, all of our graduate work on rats. So doing an experiment on an insect was, you know, now it seems common, but that was just like a whole new world to me. Like what? Insects? You know? Um, and so we had a, a couple of prototypes that we presented at the Society for Neuroscience conference uh, a number of years ago uh, just and it, nothing really worked um, it was almost, almost there like a couple months later we got everything working but even showing the the prototypes and the idea at the education section of the conference it we were just mobbed by people we were just mobbed by people and it just uh, it took Greg and I uh, uh, just uh, it took uh, just by surprise because um, we were doing traditional uh, scientific research and we had never seen such a big crowd at our normal research than this kind of side idea, side pet project. And the joke is that the brain responds to reinforcement. You know, if, if um, you know, you, you train a rat to do a, a motion for a food reward that, that that rat will increase the number of times it, it, it makes that motion, right? And so we were being reinforced in that sense that we were getting mm -hmm. positive reinforcement from the community for this side project that was much greater um, than our individual research. And and uh, Greg and I thought maybe we had something here. Maybe if you know, you, the neuroscience professors would say like, keep doing this, keep doing this, make this working, this solves a huge problem for me. I'll buy it. I'll, I'll be your first customer. And even uh, um, one of our mentors and first uh, uh, professors, Gina Poe, said, here's $60 uh, to help you pay for parts. And, uh, and when you get something working, send it to me. So like people are literally ready to open their wallets for, for prototypes. And so that's so um, we started looking for funding and we, we started getting some small grants. And then um, from the business school that turned into larger grants from the Kaufman Foundation and then the grants from the National Institutes of Health. And we slowly did the process of, um, um, of turning this idea into a working prototype and turning the working prototype into something that, you know, another person could use. And so um, it was really being able to raise funding for the enterprise that uh, – uh, allowed us to turn this into a full-time job. And again, um, it was, it's a non-traditional uh, career uh, for a scientist to get into neurotechnology and education and, and product design for the general market. But it's just the, um, the cultural rewards of, like I said earlier, of, you know, um, parents and teachers sending us pictures of people winning science fairs, all the outreach and the global impact that we've been able to do has really, uh, uh, really been encouraging and, and keeps us uh, enjoying what we do. Yeah, that sounds excellent. I mean, yeah, with this kind of feedback, you're like, okay, we're on to something. Uh, but maybe I missed it. Were you already selling these? Were you already making these by the time you graduated with a PhD? You know, uh, I graduated in 2008, and Greg was finishing up. He graduated in 2009, so we were we were we were wrapping up. I mean, at that uh, at that neuroscience conference where we presented, I I had already defended and set my thesis in. So I I think I was graduating in three more months. So I don't. And Greg was finishing his final final experiments and you know writing up his dissertation. So we were we were just finishing. So the the, the time was just was just right to to do the startup venture thing because you 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 just finished your PhD. I mean, what what does it matter to take a year and see where this goes? And uh, and that's uh, we were able to achieve some funding uh, that allowed us to uh, take a year to kind of go from um, idea to prototype to product. And so that's that's like the big that's the that's the biggest thing um, for I think a scientist or a research grade engineer is that we're very good at inventing things for the lab. Um, but I know you're, 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 you're looking into PhD opportunities. And if you visit a lab, you'll see all this, all this, all this gear being invented by all the graduate students and postdocs and scientists or, or the principal investigators. But it's like, you know, you have this button needs to be turned this way and, and this cable is kind of fragile. And here's this custom software that someone wrote, you know, like 10 years ago, don't mess with it. You know, so it's all, everything's really ha cobbled together. And so the biggest challenge for us was to get out of that culture where you get every, where everything's really custom and just works a certain way to inventing something that a, a, a general person could use with a minimum of training. And that was really, now we consider ourselves fairly good at that process, but I would say that was the hardest thing for, for, uh, for Greg and me was going from, you know, uh, a prototype culture to where you know a product culture but yeah it was we weren't sell we were we were we were still in grad school but it wasn't we were we were almost done basically so it really had nothing to do with our graduate work 
a part that our graduate work, which was learning how to do electrophysiology, tr transformed into learning how to teaching, building products that taught electrophysiology. And, and um, our uh, PI, Daryl Kipke, was very supportive. He has a large family with a lot of uh, children and, and he was saying, you know, you guys should do this. This is a great idea. So uh, we really don't have any sob stories about uh, breaking from university. It's always been um, very – people have always, you know uh, – uh, been enchanted by the idea and and, and uh, have given us uh, have offered us help when we needed it. Wow, yeah, that sounds really ideal. I mean, two times you got good positive reinforcement first at the conference, and then uh, you got the grant saying like, okay, this is feasible possibly, and this could have a future. So we're not really betting too much, or we're not having uh, too high of a stakes, and the risk isn't too bad. So yeah, just just go try it out. Um, so what was what was the process? I guess since then, like uh, that was six years ago, right? Yeah, yeah. So we the idea was formed in 2008, and then I started. Uh, Greg and I started looking for grant opportunities uh, after that neuroscience conference in Washington D.C. in 2008. And um, you rapidly realize that a lot of startup grants or business grants require you to be a business, which requires you to incorporate. Um, so we incorporated in March of 2009. We had won a business plan competition at the University of Michigan and received $500. And uh, 300 of, the, that dollar, of those dollars went to LegalZoom to incorporate as an S-Corp. Um, $100 of that $500 went to me to reimburse myself for some Radio Shack components I had bought. Uh, again, we were just finishing up grad school and didn't really have that much money. And then $100 went to Alex Wiltko, which was a um, an undergraduate working in the same lab uh, that or in the same group of labs that we were, and he had helped uh, develop some of the code uh, for our iPhone app. So we incorporated in March of 2009, and then then it was just the slog of what I said of going from a working prototype to a product that you could sell, and that was just a, working on the enclosure, working on the circuits, or ordering the board. Um, and so our first real sale was in April of uh, 2010. So that's the first time. So it was almost two years from the germ of the idea to the first product being sold and uh, sold. And that's you know that that's kind of slow. But that was us learning how to do a hardware company and uh, doing a hardware company. These are all common problems. How do you go from the first prototype to the first sale? Uh, uh, and uh, our first sale was to the University of San Diego Neuroscience Graduate Program in April of 2010. And then we just we started selling one or two or three a month, and now, um, you know, six years later, we're in the selling between 100 and 250 a month. And our first product was the Neuron Spiker Box. So that was the goal to record the electrical uh, firing of a neuron in an insect for less than $100. Um, and then when we started selling that, we started getting some feedback from the customer. So we've been really customer and public engagement driven. So a professor at the university uh, at the university in Colorado, Colorado State, Brian Tracy, uh, emailed us and said, "This is a great idea in neurons, but you know if you." You did it in muscles. You could do a lot of experiments on humans because you can do muscle electromyography without invasive electrodes. So could you modify this to do electromyography? And so we're like, oh, that's a great idea. So we modified our circuit to do electromyography, and that's also a huge seller because you can do experiments on on yourself or on students in the classroom. So involve you know involving students doing experiments and learning about the physiology of their own bodies is compelling. And so then we started, and then you know, we had this muscle amplifier that was launched about a year later, um, and. Then then the University of Washington and other kind of uh, uh, other universities that have a good focus in both engineering and neuroscience said, "Hey, you have this muscle amplifier. We're teaching a class on neural interfaces. Would it be be possible to uh, control things with the muscle?" So then, Greg. Uh, invented a shield which is a, a muscle amplifier but with a footprint that can fit in an Arduino okay and so then we started um, then we started selling that and then we started getting you know feedback from customers that said hey you know it's great that you're doing things on neurons and muscles but can you uh, can you record heartbeats and brain waves and so I, I, I modified the muscle spiker shield that Greg had invented uh, changing the filters and the gains to record uh, heart activity and EEG electroencephalography activity 
And so then we had, you know, then we had an amplifier for heart and brains. So then, you know, people in, in, in botany uh, were saying, hey, you guys are doing a great job with the neural and muscle signals um, and the heart signals, but, you know, plants also generate voltages. Can you make an amplifier that generate, you know, that works with plants like the Venus flytrap? And then, you know, Greg and I are like, oh man, Venus flytraps are so cool. You know, these plants that move and eat other bugs. Just if you go into a classroom and even show a Venus flytrap, kids just immediately crowd around because most people have never seen a Venus flytrap in their lives. And so that alone, is exciting and then if you do say it also plants generate electricity like we do and then you can show an action potential in a plant so just like i said just feedback from the community is really we keep um kind of expanding into now the mission is if it's alive and it generates an electrical signal we want to be able to record it easily uh, in, a, in a high school environment. And then on the other end uh one of our first projects was um the rubber roach which is uh, kind of, a, I guess, a second product to the neuron spiker box because, again, uh, Greg and I did our PhDs in uh, Daryl Kipke's neural engineering lab, and so, and you know, a lot of the other guests on your podcast are colleagues of ours, and so we had read about some work out of Cornell and Berkeley where you could control insects uh, wirelessly by putting wires in their antenna. Um, or ganglia, and then delivering microstimulation to those ganglia, and for a brief, for a couple moments or longer, you can can kind of control the flight of the beetle or the movements of the cockroach. And I said, oh, that's so that's so cool, you know. Like, if only, if man, I, I, I want to see that. Like, I don't want to just see a YouTube video or read about it in a scientific journal. I want to I want to see it with my own eyes, you know. Um, and so that was part. That was a project uh, that Greg and I worked on to try to make a low grade version of this technology to control insects um, and so that 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 was, came out in 2011 the first prototypes and we continue to to sell that um, and then that kind of turned into the human human interface where one person could control another person so it's really been the development of the projects you know started with this idea of can we take what's in our lab in graduate school and bring it to the high school and then that you know just by public engagement and that's why it's really good to interface with the public and get ideas from them about what they want to see what they're curious in and that has uh, kind of expanded our project product line and now we have a pretty big library of products and so now our focus this year uh, and in the years to come is to really really develop the educational content where it's not just talks by Greg or me um, or a cool videos uh, people really want kind of um, more curricular based activities they don't just want to do a demonstration they want to develop uh, you know a, a two week long neuroscience class so um, we're expanding our education team to kind of build up the uh, more formalized educational materials that can go with our equipment that's incredible. Yeah, like really like modifying your equipment until you can achieve anything or you can you can really do any kind of experiment uh, based on the feedback of the audience and, and the users and everything like this. That's excellent. That's exactly, I guess, what uh, startups should do. And, and especially, I, I guess that's the, the philosophy of Silicon Valley is like, uh, move fast and break things. So yeah, that, that's really cool. So uh, you, you're talking, you're going to be doing, you're going to be developing lessons and course materials in the future. Are you going to be doing anything else with the, the actual hardware? Hardware also? When we started, um, kind of the, you remember the iPhone had just come out. Uh, I think the iPhone came out in 2000, yeah, 10 year anniversary. It was 2007. So I remember our first, uh, and this is also funny, um, I was, you know, we're, I was born in 1979. So I'm kind of part of the computer generation, you know, that saw computers become you know, available for the home and then turn into laptops. So Greg and I were just so stoked that we could build an electronic amplifier, hook it up to our computer via, via the audio port, and actually just open up a laptop in a classroom and show neurons. And there was a sci we were presenting this at a science fair, and literally, um, I was talking to a, a 14 year old, and I was showing him the insects and uh, and the neural signals using an audio program on a computer. And I said, like, what do you think of this? Do you like it? And he said, I want to be able to record it on my phone. And I, I remember, I'm like, God, that's obviously that'd be so much better, yeah. <laughs> um, because you know, because the, the the smartphone market was just blowing up. So then. Um, that's when we started, uh, and the apps were just, the app store had just opened, right? Like the SDK had just come out, you know, it was very, very novel. And so um, we modified, uh, we made an app that could read from the microphone line in of the iPhone. And then that was, that was just, um, 
you know, and amazed us that from a huge lab full of equipment that I had a, an amplifier that could fit in my hand the size of a Sony Walkman and the uh, the iPhone or the Android device and we could record neural activity. It's just, it's still even, you can sense me talking about it, that it, it just amazed me at the time. But um but now we are we're so the uh, the spiker box amplifiers are purely analog amplifiers, um, very simple circuits with you know two chips or a third chip if you count the audio. But there's no digitization. Uh, we've been using the audio ports of the computers um, to acquire the signal and let the sound card on the laptop do the it's the analog to digital conversion. But um, as you may or may not know, the audio port is dying. <laughs> um, so we've been building, a, we've been working on a next generation versions of the both the Neuron and the Muscle Spiker Box uh, that will have a, that will do signal conditioning and digital digitization on the board and will uh, transmit information via the USB port. And so those products are, are very much finishing up the final design and marketing stages and should be announced very, very soon. So going towards uh, uh, USB connections for everything, really making the um, the software that we've uh, designed to work with our gear um, to make data analysis uh, very easy to be able to do publication grade figures with our software because we do have data analysis uh, on our software, <clears throat> but but the dirty little secret of backyard brains is that. All the publications, uh, we try to publish about once or twice a year um, in educational journals uh, and open access journals, kind of the experiments that you can do with our equipment. Um, but all those figures were generated using MATLAB, um, which is a, an expensive uh, uh, research grade uh, software analysis program that it, you can learn how to do it, but you know, I just I always, I always sort of cringe when I when I tell a sixteen year old high school student, yeah, you know, you can use MATLAB if you want to generate better figures. Maybe you can go to your local university that and look for a copy. <laughs> so yeah, just um, uh, making all the gear um, kind of pro versions uh, and also improving the software to make it easier for people to do data analysis in their own experiments. Because the with our with our amplifier library, I mean, we're pretty much almost all there. Like we have. The, the heart, the EKG amplifiers, the EEG amplifiers, the muscle amplifiers, the neural amplifiers, all the, all the interfaces where you can control things with your brain activity or your muscle activity. Um, so really it's um, making it easier to interface with our equipment and making it easier to do experiments and publish on our equipment. So that's kind of like the, the stage backyard brains is in uh, the, today and tomorrow and next week and next month. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be funny. That'd be funny if a, a backyard brains uh, equipment was one day featured in science, and and that was that was how they they uh, gathered the data. <laughs> oh yeah, then nothing makes us happier. We uh, scientists do use our gear for science experiments, and there are publications. And uh, nothing nothing pleases us more. Uh, well, I guess seeing a you know a, a kid win the science fair does actually make us happier. But it does make us happy seeing uh, uh, people use our gear for equipment, and that's what's what's also kind of the advantage of making consumer priced gear so all our equipment is around is around mobile phone prices right between uh, 150 to 300 dollars and keeping true to our mission build it yourself versions of our gear still sell for less than a hundred dollars so the, the the advantage of our gear is that people don't really need to write large grants to buy our, our equipment so we get a lot of a uh, uh, scientists who've never done electrophysiology um, and they can either pay for it out of pocket because it's consumer pri prices if they're compelled or their small grants or the other institutions can pay for the equipment out of discretionary funding so people can really do exploratory research uh, with their gear because there's not a huge risk to buy our equipment and so we've seen people uh, start adding electrophysiology to their research to their research because um, our gear is, is is accessible enough that you can you can you can start you know like like I said I, I'm always making the analogy with microscopy and and astronomy because those are really those are really those two fields have done a really good job of making consumer grade versions of their equipment so you know, I'm not going to look at spectra of pulsars when I'm, you know, when I just want to get started in astronomy. I just want to maybe look at the moon or look at the horsehead nebula and just learn how to do it. So you can buy a telescope for, you know, 25 to $50 and do that. And so you can use our gear to kind of do exploratory research. And uh, with our next generation versions of our gear that'll have calibration schemes and still be consumer priced, they'll be very powerful um, one to two channel count devices that, you know, we want to see even more of that of people uh, publishing, you know, and doing formal science uh, with our equipment.
That's excellent. Yeah, spark spark this curiosity. So many listeners are just starting out in this field. What are your recommendations for how to get into this field? And, and I, I especially like this for you because uh, you took kind of a, a non-traditional approach. Okay, yeah. So we do get emails from um, parents and, and, and students uh, and young university students all the time uh, saying – you know, I saw I saw the TED Talks your group did. Um, I read about your work in Make Magazine, or I was just looking. I just found your website because of a friend or through a random search. I'm really into neuroscience. I'm really interested into neural engineering. I want to maybe pursue it as a career. What What would you recommend? And um, what I say is just um, you know um, uh, make friends with uh, creative people. Uh, so make friends with engineers if you're not an engineer already and if you are an engineer make friends with other engineers make friends with artists just get really used just just learn the culture of of how to invent and build your own equipment and be comfortable around science equipment and so and you do that by you know you know going to science fairs uh, learning about your local community and also you do a lot of stuff socially um, and then also you do a lot of stuff uh, on your own like read go to the library and try to read every book on popular neuroscience that you can um, and with and and just uh, slowly start building up maybe start buying a, some equipment some basic scientific equipment uh, like uh, a soldering iron or a multimeter or some backyard brain skier and start just going through the experiments on our website so a lot of what if you don't even want to buy any equipment and you just want to read just you know read all the experiments that we have on our website and you'll have a pretty good uh, grasp of uh, the neuro, of basic neuroscience uh, uh, with that. But the biggest, the biggest advice is uh, just uh, like I say, just make friends with creative people. The relationship that Greg and I have uh, with uh, he, he was he's just a really good electrical engineer, and then with me looking for novel experiments, and he he looking for he, him looking for novel experiments together, and then our you know our our electroencephalography uh, EEG equipment was invented because a couple of artists were wondering if we could modify the equipment to record brain waves. Um, and I had never, I have a PhD in neuroscience and I had never seen an EEG, like never in a, in a seminar, never at a science presentation had someone just put something on their head and showed me brainwave. So I was kind of conditioned to believe that, um, uh, it was too hard to do with our uh, kind of, um, double stage amplifier equipment but you know these artists you know uh i liked them you know, i wanted to do a project with them so uh, we were we tried to do some experiments kind of basically try doing measuring um alpha waves of the visual cortex and it was really noisy but we were able to massage the data and get some um and see some activity uh at eight hertz and then we started you know improving the circuit and now you know we you know almost every day we sell an eeg amplifier on our website and that was literally just because i was at the local makerspace and and uh, there were some cool artists that, you know, um, were friendly and they wanted to do a project together. And, you know, I don't think we, I think Backyard Brains probably would have released an EEG amplifier at some point, but it probably would have been delayed by two or two years. Um, so that's really just get out there in the community, uh, hang out at your library, hang out at makerspaces and just, you know, be creative. I love it. I love it. I love your guys' uh, enthusiasm for this and just like, yeah, let's make it, you know, and, and I guess I guess that came, comes from the experience of being a grad student and being forced to do this. So uh, kind of the last question, what is the big mistake or wrong direction that you see that some researchers may be going down? What maybe don't you agree with in this, in this field? What's the big mistake? Oh, that, that's hard to think of on the spot. I think you know, like I said earlier, the biggest learning curve for our organization was going from uh, working, going from the working prototype stage to the product stage. And so that, that was just the grind of two years. Um, I can't really tell you that neuroscience and education um, is really making mistakes right now. One of the things that Backyard Brains um, tries to do um, is that like I said, with the electroencephalography amplifiers, uh, we can now go into a high school classroom, put a sweatband with electrodes embedded um, on, a, on a student and tell them to close their eyes and we can see visual activity, alpha wave activity of the visual cortex. We have some more advanced experiments that interns have done to see some evoked potential due to surprise signals or imagined movements or real movements. Um, but... I think there is a, a sometimes uh, there is a tendency to oversell 
what the EEG can do, right? So when I'm reading in popular science magazines um, about something being controlled with a mind, I'm always really trying to see if they really are controlling something with their mind. And so we have a, uh, we do have a control something with your brain experiment, um, but it's really simple. It's just uh, uh, Stanislav, a programmer who works for, with us, who, who, go, who travels between Serbia and the United States. Uh, I w we were gonna do a television appearance in Spain and I wanted to do something of control something with your brain, something new. Um, and so he just converted power of the eight hertz frequency into a tone. So when the person closes their eyes and the alpha and the visual cortex alpha wave activity increases, it, incre it, it increases the frequency of a tone. So you, uh, someone closes their eyes and you hear. So he's sort of making inst music as it were with his brain, but at the end of the day, he's opening and closing his eyes, which is changing the visual input to his visual cortex, which is changing the alpha waves. So you are controlling something with your brain, but it's a very simple kind of on off graded um, response. So I just, every time I read about brain control applications, I always get a little bit upset because I think there's a risk in our industry of overselling what the EEG can do. And there are clinical grade EEGs where people are controlling curses on their screen, but um, um, unless unless uh, unless you can walk into a classroom, put the thing on your head and, and, and control something within a couple minutes, um, just uh, for any listener who's not of the general public, just, just say, show me the demo i want to see the demo so i just i just uh that's something that backyard veins tries to do is really because we get emails all the time from people who want to control things with their brain and i'm just i'm just telling you like use muscle activity muscle activity is a lot easier you can control things with your brain but it's it's only like an on off a graded thing so i just um we just i just think sometimes we abuse that in our industry but it just shows that there is such a compelling interest in the public to learn about how the brain works and to make interfaces with it like your podcast is about neural interfaces Exactly. So maybe warning people against uh, overselling it, even if it is, even if it doesn't have a kernel of truth that, that they should, it'll it'll ruin the the path later on for the rest of the people. Yeah, yeah. So one example is um, uh, an intern made a muscle interface where he put electrodes on his left muscles, uh, forearm muscles, and electrodes on his right forearm muscles. And I don't know if you've played Mario Go on your smartphone, but you can play it just using your thumb, right? Because <laughs> um, you're just controlling Mario jumping. So one, so we, we, you can play Super Mario Brothers with just a run and jump motion. So he, he hacked a, uh, a Super Nint uh, a Nintendo, and so a Nintendo controller. So every time he flexed his muscles left, Mario would run. And every time he flexed his muscles right, Mario would jump. And I just don't, and people want to do that with EEG, and I would love to see that. But I mean, it's, it's just so much easier in muscles. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So if people like what they've heard, if they want to find out more about you or your company, how do they do that? Our biggest uh, interface with the community is through our website, uh, backyardbrains.com. And also on uh, social networks is just, just search for Backyard Brains on Facebook and Twitter. So um, it's a pretty distinctive name. It's not, it doesn't lose itself very easily uh, in internet searches. So just backyardbrains.com and it'll take you and you can start from there. Excellent. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure. Hey guys, hopefully you enjoyed it. Yeah, I really like this. I like this startup side of things because I think that's a huge, huge gap in today's scientific world is the bench to bedside gap. So basically taking a theoretical, I don't know, kind of fragile, as we talked about in the show, a fragile piece of lab equipment that's kind of held together with duct tape or don't, don't step too much or don't breathe too much because you'll you'll knock it and it won't work anymore and and bringing it into like a robust consumer device and i i really think this is missing i really wish that more people did this hopefully when these things are being de democratized and more people have access to it this will happen more and more but i think this is huge and as you may have heard it's a, it's a grind you know the startups are a grind forming a company is a grind and for two years they really didn't have much progress and they're just growing 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 and now as he said after the show, they're 
kind of at the equilibrium stage. So they're not really, they're at the break even point. So they're not really losing money. They're not really gaining money. And this is after more than six years of working on this, like almost eight years of working on this. So you can really imagine what this feels like. And obviously they would be much more rich if they, if they'd be much richer if they just went the traditional route. But if you have this burning, if you have this burning sensation, well, there's creams for that. <laughs> but if you have this like burning desire to really bring something out in the world, then startups I think are for you. And this is, this is what I want to do eventually because I, I'm, I, not so much driven by money. Money is nice, of course. It buys you jet skis in the Bahamas, which is cool for a day or two. But anyways, it, it's it's a good thing. But I think the bigger impact in this world is many times making these startups. And that's eventually what I want to do. And I think this is really cool because eventually once they figure out, once they figure out about, uh, actually once they figure out how to do sales <laughs> and really sell a lot of these things to schools and every everybody who's interested, they could be really huge and they could really impact a lot of lives. So guys, if you see a huge spike in neurologists and brain machine interface people and all this, it could be because of them, because they may have inspired some kids, and then a few years down the line, they became scientists. And then hopefully, maybe, well, maybe one day, like all these diseases and stuff like this, brain machine interfaces will be that much better because of them. So thank you. Thank you, future backyard brains people. Thank you for the, the your help in the year 2025, in the future, with flying cars, woo, and lasers and everything like this. You've made this future happen. Thank you so much. Okay, guys, hopefully you enjoyed this and uh, enjoy maybe some of this whimsical stuff as well. But we'll see each other next week or hear each other next week. Ciao, ciao. Hope you enjoyed the show and were able to learn something new, bringing together different fields in novel ways. Until next time on the Neural Implant Podcast.